Hello, this is Cody Seip. I want to welcome you all to our webinar today with the Functional Aging Institute. Really excited to have Dr. Emily Splickle back with us. Uh, Emily has been with us a number of times. We've known each other a while now. She was actually one of our uh, keynote speakers at our very first summit. Wasn't that right, Emily? I was, yes. Yeah. Now it's great. five years later. Well, and then last year, um, you did a, a number of great sessions for us in a pre-con at our summit, and we're excited you're going to be back next year as well, so that's that's pretty cool. And you've got your own summit coming up, correct? Yes, October 26th, 27th in Arizona. And that's really cool. You kind of have set that up as kind of a, a kind of two parts, right? It's kind of a brain awakening part and then a pelvic part, is that correct? Yeah, so day one is brain awakening, which I know is a hot topic at the Functional okay. Aging Summit this year. And then day two is pelvic balance, which is kind of ties in what I'm speaking on today and is another really important topic, um, obviously related to pelvic floor, but exceeding beyond just pelvic floor. Yeah, well, that's, that's really interesting. Well, we're excited to have you with us, and I'm very interested to hear more about this topic of coccidemia. Um, so that's very interesting. And for those of you that are listening, uh, if you've not heard Dr. Emily speak before, you're in for a real treat. She does a great job of really detailing the, the science and the evidence and the rationale, but also making it very practical and applied, uh, which, is, which is why so many people uh, love her education or her live and her online education as well. So we're excited to get this going. If you guys have questions along the way, I want you to just put those uh, into our chat box and we'll try to get to those uh, as we go, but, but it might have to save those uh, until the end. Uh, this video will be recorded. We're gonna put this in our uh, FAI membership uh, section. So lots of great content there. So Emily, why don't you take it away for us? Excellent, thank you so much, Cody. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in live. Um, or if you're catching this on the recording, thank you so much for your time. We are, as uh, Cody had mentioned, speaking about coccidinia. Um, I think it's a topic that is perhaps within the wheelhouse of, of the listeners. Maybe some of your clients are presenting with it, and maybe you're kind of wondering how it ties into some other pathology, how you can address it from a corrective exercise perspective, and uh, hopefully we'll get some, some good takeaways for everyone. Uh, so let me do one second, perfect. All right, so as Cody had introduced me, Dr. Splickle, uh, I am a podiatrist, so obviously I focus on feet. You might be wondering how I got all the way up into the tailbone, but our feet are very powerfully connected to our core. Everything I speak about at the summits and my, my education and with my patients is foot to core connections, foot to core sequencing. So I actually do see patients with tailbone pathology in my office. And I'll go into a little bit of how I address that and uh, some of that anatomy. As Cody had mentioned, I'm part of EBFA, that's my education company. We have the Barefoot Strong Summit coming up that uh, I'll speak about towards the end if you guys have any questions on it. Um, these are the dates. This is a intro webinar to a session that I'm doing at the summit. So um, I could speak for hours on coccidinia. So I just want you to know, think of this as a tease into that session, still getting you powerful information, but every pathology that ties into tailbone anatomy, it, it would be really hard to cover that in, in one hour. So let's just jump on into it, get started. So coccidinia is also known as coccygodinia, so if you happen to see, hear it as that, or coxalgia, all of these mean, mean that you're having pain in the region of the tailbone or the coccyx. Now this could be a um, literal cause of the pain, like your, your client fell and they hit their tailbone or they were sitting um, you know, improperly or they had a really long flight and then the flight just being seated that long, they got a bursa or a fluid filled sac that is irritated over the tailbone. Those could be some of the causes of coccidinia, um, but the ones that I want to focus on are much more muscular imbalance based. 
So that's, that means that we have to understand the anatomy a little bit more versus a traumatic cause of tailbone pain or coccidinia. So if we're thinking of coccidinia in general, typically triggered by seating, which is what I have said, a long flight, um, maybe you're sitting improperly, we'll speak about that. Maybe your sacrum is not moving sufficiently, which is not allowing you to sit the right ways. You're actually sitting on your tailbone and putting pressure on it. Uh, what's interesting is that it's five times more common in women than men, and we'll go into why that is the case. And you actually see it quite frequently in pregnancy as well. It's one of the most common symptoms in pregnancy. Obviously, the pelvis is going through a lot of changes. The pelvic floor is going through a lot of changes. So then it is a very common symptom in pregnancy for women. Now, the tip of the tailbone or the coccyx can be hypermobile in some, some individuals. And it can actually sublux. I'll show you a x-ray of what that would look like. Again, that may or may not be how it presents to you, but just knowing that you can have that presentation is important. And then from a diagnosis perspective, specifically the subluxation is best through dynamic radiographs. So that means that the patient is moving while you're doing those radiographs. Oh, sorry, I should have warned you. <laughs> So the tailbone is actually a vestigial tail and at the eighth week of gestation you actually lose that tail. So the tail comes off which means that we obviously are born without a tail. If you saw the picture briefly you saw <laughs> that some people don't lose the tail. I'll go through this quickly because I showed my husband and he was like I can't believe you're showing that but some people are born with the tail. If this freaks you out, I will move past it. Okay, <laughs> the vestigial tail, we should lose it. <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry, Cody. That, that's the most interesting thing I've seen in a while. <laughs> oh, is <that> okay? <laughs> if you wanna see it again, you can totally go back to the recording. I just don't wanna freak anyone out because uh, it kinda, it grosses me out and I, I see, some pretty scary feet, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the tail that was there that I moved past actually doesn't have nerve in it. It's, it's fat and it's muscle, which is really fascinating that people can move that tail. Oh, just freaks me out. Okay. <laughs> now, going back to our coccidinia. So coccyx, the position changes from being seated and standing, and this is important the mechanics of the sacrum and the pelvis have to be sufficient so that we're not sitting on our tailbone in a way that's going to put pressure and stress to either the bursa or to the tailbone itself. So you can see that um, as we're moving from a seated to a standing position, I apologize, you want to actually have it tuck under. So the tucking under of the tailbone is very important for proper sitting mechanics. If we were sitting in more of an anterior tilt, you could put a pressure on the end of that tailbone, and then that could start to lead to some of the stress or the bursitis on the tailbone or the coccyx. As I had mentioned earlier, it's diagnosed a subluxation or an improperly moving tailbone or coccyx is diagnosed through dynamic radiographs. So you would have the patient seated, you'd have them standing, and then you measure the angles of the movement of the tailbone. Now, you can see in the x-ray here that the tailbone has actually subluxed. So that subluxation would be picked up. That's a very different pathology, which is something that probably a lot of us are not going to see but again, you never know. That's probably traumatic associated. What we're going to be focusing on, as I had mentioned, is going to be more the muscle imbalances. So huge difference between male and female pelvises. We know this a lot as far as the female pelvis is based around giving birth. So the pelvic outlet, which is the base here, if you can see my arrow, that is the pelvic outlet 
is more oval shaped and is larger in the female, obviously for giving birth, passing um, the baby. So the shape is very different. The angle of the uh, ischium and the sacrum is also different. As far as how it relates to the tailbone or the coccyx, what's important is you can see the male sacrum and coccyx is actually facing more anterior. So it's at a greater angle where the female sacrum and coccyx is pointing more downward. So you can actually appreciate that difference in these pictures of the angle of the sacrum and the tailbone. So the female, if the female has insufficient sacral movement, the chances of a female sitting literally on the tailbone is going to be much higher, leading to, again, that bursitis and that coccydinia. Oh, some very important muscle attachments that relate to our coccyx. On the front of the coccyx, there's attachments to our levator ani muscles, so I'm gonna go into those. A muscle called the coccygeus muscle. Um, the iliococcygeus and the, the pubo and ano, the, all of those are your levator ani muscles. So those can be grouped in. Again, I'll show you on a picture what that looks like. And then on our posterior side, really important connection of our glute max. So glute max attachment on the back, levator ani on the front of our coccyx. So we need to obviously have a balance between anterior and posterior muscles to ensure that our coccyx or our tailbone is able to move. Now, because your tailbone connects to your sacrum, we also want to make sure that we're achieving optimal sacral movement in our clients as well. The muscles that are attaching to our sacrum, we have our adductors, our bicep femoris, your glutes are obviously on there as well, that same coccygeus muscle, your erectors, your external obliques, piriformis. Oh, there are a lot of muscles that are attaching to your sacrum and, of course, to your coccyx, which means if you have insufficient mobility or balance in the timing and stabilization of these muscles, this is a huge contributor to coccydinia. Okay, so we take a look at the anatomy. So I circled some of the key players here. So this is obviously your sacrum. This is your coccyx tailbone. And then there's an important ligament that's coming down here, this attachment of this ligament. So this is your anal coccygeal ligament. Having balance in that is really important for tailbone mobility. You do want to have a little bit of mobility. And what I want you to remember or appreciate is that you have a right side to your tailbone and a left side to the tailbone. So you can have, in, when it comes to this anatomy that I'm gonna go over in a moment, you could have a left side um, overactivation or adhesion where your right side is totally balanced. What can happen if the anatomy on, let's say the left side, is a little bit more overactive, you can start to pull, if you can see the arrow again, pull the tailbone more towards the left side of the individual's anatomy, and that can also contribute to coccydinia, and it can contribute to the way that they would sit or potentially put pressure on their tailbone. So if we're looking at the anatomy, there's some important uh, kind of blending muscles that we wanna take in. Here on this side, this is your levator ani. So as I had said, this is the three muscles that kind of break down your levator ani. We can see we come here, these are the muscles here. Your levator ani, specifically the iliococcygeal, blends into a very important deep hip rotator or stabilizer, which is your obturator internus. This is something big that we go into in EBFA's education, is how the obturator internus, deep hip rotator, blends into iliococcygeal or your levator ani slash posterior pelvic floor. So we'll, I'll reference that again in a moment, but please, please, please remember that. Another big muscle that we wanna look at is piriformis. 
So when you look at the literature of sacral slash uh, tailbone pathology, you see a lot of it within the piriformis. So if you have any clients that have piriformis syndrome, you want to also work them up for potential coccidinia or tailbone pathology. You may also want to do that with those that are presenting with sciatica. So any of your sciatica clients start thinking of, okay, I wonder how their sacrum and their tailbone is moving and is that potentially contributing to their piriformis syndrome or vice versa? Is piriformis syndrome and pathology contributing to the way the tailbone and the sacrum are moving? And then glute max and minimus, we want to mention those as well, that your glute max does attach to the posterior tailbone. So optimal glute engagement requires optimal tailbone position and mobility. This is a different perspective. So I'm going to show three different perspectives of the tailbone anatomy. Looking at this one, we can see the same thing. So this is our levator ani muscles here. These are blending into the tailbone. Specifically, the iliocoxygeal is blending into the tailbone. And then our glute max is here as well. You can see how that blends into the tailbone. That was a little bit hard to appreciate from the other angle. So I want you to appreciate that here. And then we have our anal coccygeal ligament. You can see how that blends into uh, the anal sphincter. And then, as I had mentioned, the levator ani muscles. Here, sacral tuberous ligament. Going to go into that huge in a moment, but I want you to appreciate that as well. Okay, so one last cut that we're looking at, or angle, this is our lateral. So here you can appreciate much more the blend of obturator internus deep hip stabilizer to the iliococcygeus, which is one of your levator ani muscles. So you want to appreciate that connection. We have our piriformis again, and of course we have our glute max and your anal ligament. If you're looking at all of these anatomical pictures here, this perspective, and then of course this perspective, you can see that the anatomy is very complex. There's a lot of small muscles that are blending into each other. There's a lot of small muscles that are originating on the anterior and the posterior part of the sacrum and the tailbone that we need to be in harmony or balance in any of those muscles. So some potential players in the pathology of what I want you to start thinking of now that we've uh, defined coccidinia, that we've seen the anatomy, that we understand that the sacrum and the tailbone has to move when we go from a standing to a seated position, that that movement is a little bit um, higher priority in women just because of our anatomy and that our sacrum is pointed or our tailbone is pointed more vertically where men's is pointed anteriorly. And then of course, in any of your uh, pre peri or postnatal clients, this is a higher uh, uh, importance just because of the changes that are happening uh, to the pelvis during pregnancy. So some of those potential players is restricted sacral movements can increase stress to the coccyx. Pelvic floor spasms, specifically the posterior pelvic floor or what is happening in the levator ani. Little side note that I want to add is that there are some levator ani avulsions that can happen. These can happen in birth. And these can also happen um, just from chronic spasm to those muscles that it is a diagnosis to have a levator ani avulsion off of the tailbone. So that would just be something to have in the back of the mind or want to rule out. Other potential players is obesity. That again is changing the position of the pelvis and the potential mobility of the pelvis. And then again, pregnancy, if you have um, a posterior facing baby, this can put more stress on the tailbone and the sacrum 
So for those that do work with uh, peri and postnatal, that that would be something that you want to have in the back of your mind. Any um, peri postnatal, I like to ask, what direction was your baby facing? Was it anterior or posterior? Posterior means that the back of the head is against the tailbone versus anterior, you want to have the baby facing the mom's back versus facing out. When they face out, it just changes the way that their bones are hitting the mom's bones or the mom's spine, that it puts a lot of pressure. Piriformis syndrome, as I had mentioned, or sciatica, that can contribute to it. And then SI joint pain, Whew, huge one as well. Any of those clients with SI joint issues, we're gonna to totally go into the sacral tuberous ligament. This blends into SI joint pathology. Um, I see quite a bit of SI joint pain in my office. So if you see that, you also wanna think about potential balance around that tailbone or the coccyx. And then, of course, our sacral tuberous ligament. We're going to go into that. And if you have any clients that may have a pudendal nerve entrapment, this is often linked to the sacral tuberous ligament. Here we go into our sacral tuberous ligament. So this ligament arises from the back of the sacrum, the posterior. The upper coccyx is fibers blend into the posterior ligaments of the sacrum. So this is a very fascially connective tissue rich area. And then that is blending into the posterior superior iliac spine. It contributes to the strength of the pelvis, inhibits mutation, and provides an attachment point for your glute max and your bicep femoris. Right here is your pelvis, and we can appreciate the sacrotuberous ligament that is coming down here and then connecting up here. So this is a very broad ligament and it's connecting the back of the tailbone, the sacrum, and then over to here, your PSIS, and then it's blending into, my arrow can come down, into your bicep femoris, which would go down this way. And then your glute max, remember, is going to attach here. So very broad attachment and anatomy that is stabilizing your SI joint through that sacrotuberous ligament. Now I wanna give you a different perspective again, is here. So this is right here, the underneath ligament, that's your sacrotuberous ligament. The one that is here is your supraspinous ligament, and in between both of those is your pudendal nerve. So your pudendal nerve, if you've ever had a client that has had pudendal nerve issues, um, I actually had a patient who was just not able to sit. You know how they have to sit in those donuts. She had trigger points, tons of intravaginal and perineal uh, trigger points and adhesions and severe pain. Pudendal nerve entrapments can lead to a lot of pain and pathology. And unfortunately, a lot of these patients are suffering Kind of in silence right because it's not that it's a voodoo topic to talk about but it's not something that you you openly just provide and they might not know that their pudendal nerve entrapment is relevant to what you guys do as movement specialists they might kind of play it off that it's you know more sexual organ based it has nothing to do with the squats that they're doing Obviously, we as movement professionals know that there's a huge tie-in. So one of those things that I want you to think about is if there's pudendal nerve entrapment, does this client or individual have sacrotuberous ligament contractures, adhesions, um, maybe a little bit of, of shortening that is putting pressure on that pudendal nerve? Now, what happens when your sacral tuberous ligament contracts or has adhesions or is, is less um, rubber bandy, just thinking of all the connective tissue words, what happens is the pelvic outlet 
which is the circular base here, the pelvic outlet starts to contract and close. When the pelvic outlet narrows or closes, what happens is the top of the pelvis, the upper portion, see where my arrow is, here actually opens up. And we want it to be a balance between the top and the bottom, especially if you're giving birth, you actually want it to be the opposite. But if you get contracture or shortening pelvic outlet, and you start to get a fanning of the upper portion of the pelvis, that's going to start to throw off your SI joints, the timing of that stabilization, and the way that they're transmitting impact forces during dynamic movement. So we wanna make sure that we're appreciating that. Now, the way that we want to start to address this is, okay, so we have just as a summary of how we can start to use this, is you have your tailbone, you understand the coccydinia and the anatomy around it. We understand that we need to have a balance between sacral movement and tailbone or coccyx movement. Your sacral tuberous ligament is going to be one of the ones that I'm focusing on for today's webinar, just because it's one that I see so often, and it's one that is very, very important anywhere you know, peri or postnatally, and then of course with our SI joint pain and other pathology I mentioned. So I'm gonna go through the correctives that I use for my patients to try to create a little bit more balance around the tailbone through the sacral tuberous ligament. So starting with sacral tuberous ligament release. Now the same release technique that I'm gonna show you is one that you can use to release the iliococcygeus. So this could be for both. I actually recommend doing both in my patients when they have pelvic floor issues, tailbone issues, or deep hip issues, such as a labral tear. So in this video, I am, I have a lacrosse ball and I'm finding my issue tuberosity. So if those who are, are listening kind of want to go through it at the same time is to find your issue tuberosity. You can't do it standing because your glutes are in the way. So you want to make sure that you're flexing the hip or you're in a seated position. You're going to find your issue tuberosity or your sits bone, and then you're going to go just inside, so just medial to the issue tuberosity. Now, when you go just medial, that is where you're going to place the lacrosse ball. So you'll see in the video that that's where I'm placing it. If you stay right there, you're, you're on the sacral tuberous ligament and the iliococcygeus, so kind of the blend of those two muscles or that ligament. To get more of the iliococcygeus, you want to roll the lacrosse ball a little bit more anterior. So you'll hit a slightly different perspective of the medial side of the issue of tuberosity. And then to get, <coughs> sorry, my baby, um, to get more of the, sacral tuberous ligament, you want to find the issue tuberosity and then go posterior. And then that posterior, you're going to work your way from the issue tuberosity to your tailbone carefully. And you'll see how I'm moving my leg in a moment. So, let's see if it'll play. Um, Why is it not playing? Oh yes, okay. So now it's, my apologies. If not, it'll be, I will make sure that I upload it. So I'm finding, I'll just talk you through it because I don't know why the video is not playing. So I'm placing the ball underneath my issue tuberosity. Again, I'm going just medial. And then when I go medial, I'm gonna go a little bit more posterior. And you will feel, if you have adhesions or tightness in your sacral tuberous ligament, you will absolutely feel it. It will be quote unquote painful, right? Just like when you do a trigger point release. And then what I'm doing that the video is not showing, I apologize, is I'm lifting my leg, my left leg up and down. So I'm doing um, pinpoint pressure onto the sacral tuberous ligament 
while moving the leg up and down. So I'm just bringing my left leg a little bit off of the ground and back down while I'm doing that release. If you don't want to move the leg, you could hold the lacrosse ball on the sacral tuberous ligament and then do some diaphragmatic breathing, just relax into it, and then you want to get that release. Now I do recommend staying a little bit closer to the issue of tuberosity and being just kind of cognizant of the fact that your pudendal nerve is underneath this ligament. So just be careful of how much pressure you're putting down and you never want to roll aggressively across any of that tissue. So just kind of pinpoint your way across. You could do issue tuberosity and then right next to your tailbone. So you're doing both ends of that ligament avoiding the in-between aspect of that ligament, which is where the pudendal nerve runs, and then you would get that sufficient release. Give it a couple minutes of doing that release. After doing this, we're going to follow it with, mm, what happened? My apologies. It did not like that. Okay, we're gonna follow it with a piriformis stretch. Now this is a piriformis stretch similar to what they do in FRC or functional range conditioning. So it's, it's up to you on the piriformis stretch you wanna do. Um, I like this one, I'm in a 90-90 uh, position and then I'm rotating and going over my knee almost like a modified pigeon is what you could call this. Holding this stretch after doing the trigger point release and then going into a pelvic outlet stretch. Uh, I hope this video will work as well, but this is a pelvic outlet stretch. I'm shifting my body weight back. Of course, it's not going to work. I'll embed these and make sure that you guys get these later. Is I'm shifting my body weight back so if you can follow the, the arrow, I'm shifting my body weight back. And when you shift back, your sits bones are spreading. So your sits bones, your pelvic outlet is opening and becoming wider when you shift your body weight back or posterior. I'm shifting my body weight back about 45 degrees. I'm not going into a full child pose position, shifting body weight back, and then I shift back into my quadruped. Shift back 45 degrees, feel my issue tuberosity spread, feel the pelvic outlet open, and then return to the quadruped position. So Emily, it looks like your, your, your knees and your feet are basically set up in a quadruped position, right? You're not going wide with your knees or pulling your feet in together? Correct, yes, okay. so I'm just staying in a neutral position for the, uh, for this shift. Okay. Okay. And then the final one is that I'm doing a sacrum stretch. So going back to the beginning, apologies for the videos, is sacral tuberous ligament release. Give it a couple minutes, say five minutes if you would like. From there, going into a piriformis stretch. From there, going into a pelvic outlet stretch, we'll call it quote unquote stretch, which is the quadruped shift back. And then the last step of it would be a sacrum stretch. So there's two positions or two ways that you can do this is this one I am in my child pose position. And then the trainer or here my husband is pushing my sacrum, uh, not down, he's not pushing me down, he's pushing my sacrum under, like he's trying to tuck my tailbone under for me very gently. And then you could see that in a standing position as well, that he's trying to push my tailbone and my sacrum into a posterior position to allow a gentle release of sacrotuberous ligament and the other connective tissue that surrounds the sacrum. These uh, stretches and mobility that I showed, the sacrotuberous ligament, um, the piriformis, the pelvic outlet, and the sacrum stretch are a key part of a program called Spinning Babies, which whether you work with pre-postnatal clients, I suggest going there because there's a lot of resources on pelvic anatomy 
and exercises to optimize pelvic function and sacral movement, just because obviously it's very important in pregnancy. And these are some really good stretches that are not just for postnatal, prenatal, perinatal. Um, any of the clients with sacral issues or pelvic balancing, I would suggest going into these different exercises. These are something that I would recommend in a symptomatic client to be done every single day, ideally twice a day if they can. Make it a, you know, eight to 10 minute routine, nothing too crazy, so that they could fit it into their schedule. This is not the end all be all. This is not where we stop the client. <laughs> we obviously have to go into more advanced concepts. And from here, when we get the client asymptomatic or their, their pain scale, if they truly have a very sore tailbone that is painful for them to even sit, we really want to just first start with more of the releasing, finding the balancing, try to stretch out the pelvic outlet, try to relax the sacrum. Once you get them into a more uh, quiescent state, then we start looking at these advanced concepts, which are a key part of everything I speak about, is we want to think about the timing of the stabilization of these muscles. So is it that their pelvic floor and their diaphragm are not engaging fast enough and they're getting into their piriformis too quickly or overactivating that is actually inhibiting some of these smaller muscles or these um, Technically, they're called local stabilizers, these local muscles. We want to, of course, think of the role of our foot-to-core integration, which is everything I speak about. Once we get the pelvic balanced, because our baseline functional movement is walking, we need to get foot activation to connect to these deep stabilizers. And the way that all of those muscles around the sacrum and the tailbone are coordinating with our feet intrinsics. Of course, blending in breathing and diaphragm stability in this condition. So we want to have balance and harmony between uh, top of our core and bottom of our core. So if the client is not breathing the right way, this could absolutely lead to pelvic floor issues. And we know that pelvic floor issues can lead to tailbone restrictions or um, a lack of sacral movement. And then finally, we want to look at the role of emotional anxiety, autonomic nervous system imbalances that could be manifested in the uh, pelvic floor or the muscles that surround the tailbone and the sacrum. Uh, there was, I was looking at some of the research around Levator syndrome. Levator syndrome is not, not coccidinia. It would be more like posterior pelvic floor issues, Levator ani. Um, adhesions that cause a lot of issues with um, rectal function. And it's very common towards the later decades of life. So that's, you know, very um, FAI appropriate. Uh, what was interesting is in one of the research studies, they actually found that a lot of this levator syndrome or levator ani adhesions were linked to anxiety conditions and that people house and manifest their emotions through body tension. And a lot of people will put that tension in their posture pelvic floor. Super fascinating. Maybe I'll talk about that at next year's summit. <laughs> yeah, that does sound very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's so powerful how, how we manifest uh, emotions in our body. And yeah. the pelvic floor, I mean, if someone's kind of like buttoned up, you know, they, <laughs> they just keep their tension in their pelvic floor, which a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I will go over any questions. I'm just showing the flyer from our Barefoot Strong Summit, the pelvic balance side of it, which is day two. And then we have a discount code for anyone through FAI as our um, thank you for being a part of FAI's network and supporting EBFA and everything that we do is you get $50 off. We have both an online and a live access to our summit. So make sure if you are going to sign up that you use that code so you get $50 off. All right. That's awesome. Well, let me, let me ask you, um, I'm going to say kind of a, a simplified 
breakdown of this. So thinking of, all right, a, a trainer, how do they how do they easily kind of apply this to to which clients in order to start, you know, their their segue into exploring this a little bit more and then learning a little bit more uh, about this area. So kind of who who should they be looking for um, symptomatic wise, you know, questions they should ask in order to think about even these basic stretches and movements that that you've showed and kind of applying them because I certainly think if you know women you know uh, after giving birth or multiple births certainly can have a, a, you know a lot of these issues that are going to remain i think my wife is a classic example uh, our first child was huge and she's ever since then you know 20 this is 20 years ago has said there's something wrong with my tailbone you know she she recognizes that there's there's an issue there but how do you approach this especially like even a guy in with female clients you know how do you know who to approach, what questions to ask, what symptoms to look for in order to start applying these to them? Yeah, so I would I would honestly screen out any client uh, female question, of course, is, you know, have they given birth? And then did they give birth vaginally is a question. This is kind of my baseline screens of, okay, have you had children? How many? Um, if you did, you know, how many were vaginal? Any complications? Okay. How long was your labor? That's really important. And then if they happen to remember if the baby was facing anterior or posterior, those are my prenatal screening questions. Um, and then other ones could be any related to incontinence is, is a question that you could ask. Um, pain during sex is another really big kind of screener that you could ask. Do they have um, any hip pathology? Do they have groin pain? Groin pain often is showing that there's an imbalance in the deep stabilizers and um, some of the anterior muscles. Um, I'm actually going into uh, the anterior pubic joint at the summit because it's very much tied into pelvic balance, but that can start to trigger pelvic floor, pelvic harmony imbalances? Do they have sciatica? Have they ever had a history of sciatica? Do they have a torn hip labrum? Does their uh, leg or their hip snap, quote unquote snap or pop, when they bring their leg from flexion into extension? So if you're lying on your back and you your leg is straight up and you bring it down, almost like if you were gonna do like a, a bicycle ab exercise. Uh, yeah. Um, and they feel like there's a snapping or a popping in the groin every time they're doing it. That can allude to pelvic, um, a loss of pelvic balance. Um, anything related to the diaphragm you could tie into there or just literally say like, you know, do you have tailbone pain? I mean, that's, yeah. you know, okay. a lot of people do think of tailbone pain as uh, like, like a bruised tailbone because they sat on it almost like if you get a bursitis in your elbow from being on like your elbows on a desk. Uh -huh. too, like they just think of it too literally that this is a bony prominence that I put pressure on and now I have pain like a bone bruise and I just need to take the pressure off of it and it will go away. Right. That's grossly oversimplifying it. And I would say that the orthopedic community probably grossly oversimplifies it that same way. Okay. Well, we got a few questions that have come in uh, that are interesting. Kind of first one, can the same type of therapeutic approach be applied to vulvodynia as well? Um, yes, that would be a little bit different from the, the nerves that are associated with it. Um, but yes, pelvic harmony, you know, there's so many nerves that are down there. Yeah. I would say for any pelvic floor, pelvic issues, whether it's vulvodynia or pudendal nerve or rectal base, um, you know, you could even take it into like a hemorrhoid function. So what is happening with the uh, pelvic floor harmony is yes, you want to find balance in all of these. Um, the ones that I focused on were a little bit more posterior. So you would want to make sure that you're doing specific uh, psoas releases in certain clients as well. That can create a lot of um, disharmony as well mm -hmm. okay and then uh what a, like if if you're screening this kind of as a, a trainer as a fitness professional um 
you know, is is there a referral process that you should be thinking of? Like, should you know, if you're, you're thinking there's 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 some um, complex issues going on here uh, related to the tailbone, should should they be referred out to somebody, and who would that be? Yes. So if you the the palpation that I gave for the sacro tuberous ligament and for the iliococcygeus, which is part of the levator ani, those are obviously external evaluation or palpations that I gave and external releases. Sometimes the adhesions can be too great or actually deeper or in a different aspect of the um, muscle or ligament that they might require internal um, trigger point release or adhesion release soft tissue work. That would be a pelvic floor physical therapist, yeah. or pelvic floor manual therapist, a lot of them specialize in um, pregnancy, of course, but still for male pathology, um, male pelvic floor pathology is, is just as important as female. And I think that there's probably a lot of missed, uh, missed men that are experiencing or quote unquote suffering in silence because they just don't think that it's something that would relate to them. They might associate it to pregnancy. Um, yeah. Anything related to like prostate, prostate um, pathology, maybe a, have a history of prostate cancer, you would want to think of that as well with these. Well, I tell you, I've got um, some local friends here that uh, they both run a really successful physical therapy practice, but they're also basically like you, they're, they're very movement oriented um, and understand a lot about what, you know, uh, kind of what we do in, in kind of the personal training in the fitness realm, corrective exercise, et cetera. Well, they started up in their practice, they started up a uh, pelvic floor specialization just a couple of years ago because they felt like there was a need for it. And they said they, they've just been overwhelmed with how many people have needed this pelvic floor therapy. There, there's so many pelvic issues and even men, you know, I was asking about the men versus women. And he was like, yeah, there are more women, but there's so many men that need it as well. So I think that really re reiterates what you're what you saying. Yeah, no, so we, we want to make sure that we're screening our male clients as well. Yeah. And you know, I, I put all of my stuff on, a, my questions on a sheet, like an intake form, because some of those questions are really personal and private. And if you're asking them out loud, the client might not uh, feel comfortable kind of expressing and saying, yes, I have pain here, or, you know, I have trouble defecating, I have constipation, or, you know, those are, those are sometimes hard to answer out loud. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's what I was, that's what I was kind of asking about some of the questions and who to look for, because um, I was especially thinking about the, the, the gender issue of, you know, male trainers asking females and vice versa. Some of those questions can be a little, little sensitive, so you have to approach them you know, the correct way in order to get a, a, an honest response from them. Yep, 100%. And then having them understand how it connects into movement. Um, I, I feel that, I mean, I even have patients that I ask them a question and they think because I'm a podiatrist, it's not going to connect in. And then, of course, it eventually comes out that they had, you know, some sort of pelvic floor issue or whatnot. And you know, they don't understand how it's connected. So we just need to make sure that we are getting those questions and they understand that everything is connected in the body. Right. Exactly. Definitely. Well, we're, we're getting a, a whole bunch more uh, very specific questions that, that are coming in and I know we can't uh, answer all of them. Is, is there a, is there a way to reach out to you to answer some of these questions that they have? Yes, absolutely. So the email is education at e b fafitness.com. Perfect. That would be great because I, I think you're right. There's so many related issues that tie in. Um, I think you could shed some light on some of the, the questions that are being asked. Well, we really appreciate you being here, Emily. This, this was very fascinating and interesting. I learned a lot. Um, I think that there's going to be some people very interested in uh, hearing more about this and, and attending your summit either live or online. Uh, so best of luck in getting that all planned. I know that's a, a huge feat to get those events planned. So uh, best of luck. And we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us on this webinar. 
Good. Thank you so much. And if anyone wants those videos that, unfortunately, I apologize, they didn't play, um, or the PowerPoint, I'd be more than happy to send that to anyone. Well, I'll tell you what we can do. We, we have the, the list of all the attendees, all the people that registered. Um, and why don't you, you can work with us. We can send that directly to them if you can send us some links. Okay, absolutely will. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for attending.